Developed in the late 1930s and early 1940s, the F4U Corsair was designed to use the largest available aero engine at the time. Having to use a large propeller to make the most of the enormous 2,000 horsepower from the Pratt & Whitney double wasp radial engine resulted in the distinctive gullwing appearance of the aircraft, which gave enough clearance for the propeller whilst on the ground. Join me in this video as I build and review the 172nd scale plastic model kit of the F4U 1A Corsair from Ravel. Before I start the video, a quick shout out to my patrons for the support they give me. A massive thank you to you. For more information on patronage, check out the links under the video. Also, thanks to Shuttle Factory for allowing me to feature this video on his channel. Don't forget that if you'd like to see Shuttle Factory's awesome custom build of the same model kit, but in Royal New Zealand Air Force colours, make sure to pop over to my channel to see it. So, today's video is a build and review focusing on this relatively recent introduction to the Ravel range. If you'd like to see what's included in the box and the quality of the tooling, take a look at the unboxing video I made on this kit on my channel. This video takes a look at how the kit builds up and what it looks like at the end. Before I start building, as always, please remember that adult supervision may be required due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. Ravel recommends this kit for those aged 10 years and older. First, I began the build by washing the plastic parts in warm, soapy water. This step helps to remove any dirt or oil left over from the moulding process. The plastic will then have a good clean surface for the paint and cement to stick to. Whilst the parts were air drying, I went through the instructions and wrote on the paint numbers that I was going to use. Although Ravel have their own way of indicating the paints to be used, I find that it's not the best so I chose to do this to make it easier for me. I removed the cockpit components from their sprue. I used snips and a sharp knife throughout this build in order to do this. Any rough areas or flash can then be sanded smooth using a nail file. I used Tamiya Extra Thin Cement to bond the plastic parts together. I like this product as it flows well into little gaps and is easy to accurately place thanks to the included brush in the pot. The cockpit builds up quite well, featuring a number of components, giving a reasonable representation of the real thing without aftermarket extras. This being said, the lack of an included pilot figure is somewhat disappointing. Next, I removed the fuselage halves from their sprue and cleaned them up with a nail file, and the cockpit instrument panels were then cemented into their respective halves. Humbrol 78 matte cockpit green acrylic was then thinned with Tamiya acrylic thinner at a rough ratio of about two parts paint to one part thinner. This will help it flow over the plastic better, leaving fewer brush strokes when it dries, but this will mean a number of thin coats may be required. I painted all of the internal areas of the cockpit and rear wheel well using a medium sized brush to ensure quick and even coverage. Whilst the paint was drying, the wing halves were cemented together. The fit was quite good, but they did need to be held together until the cement had set to prevent them from coming apart as there was a slight tendency for them to bend away from each other. The air intakes on the front of the wings come as separate parts, and it's at this point they can be added to the wing assembly. The wing tips come as individual parts as well, which I thought was a little strange as you don't normally see that kind of design choice in this type of kit. They were cemented into their respective slots in the ends of the wings. You must take care here as if they are not aligned correctly, they will look somewhat strange. Also, small gaps can be present here which would again look wrong when the model is finished, so just watch out for that. The machine gun ports in the front of the wings are also individual mouldings, so they can now be added. I found they needed a small amount of cleaning up in order to make them fit nice and neatly. Next, I started working on the engine assembly. This builds up in a series of layers, starting with the rear firewall, then the two layers of cylinders. It's worth noting that the propeller is designed to be able to spin freely, so be careful with that cement. The mounting pin for the propeller is inserted into one of the layers, but not glued in place. 
When this part is cemented on top of the previous layers, the pin is then held securely. I can't have been too careful when I placed my cement though, some of it must have seeped into the pin area and this has resulted in mine becoming fixed in place. I'm not too worried about this though. Humbrol 27 C Grey Matte Acrylic was used on the instrument panels on the inside of the cockpit and this time I used it straight out of the pot, which meant that only one layer was needed. I also used this same paint as the base colour for the engine assembly. I used a medium sized brush and worked it into all the various details. Humbrol 60 Matte Scarlet Acrylic was used to pick out the cylinder on the inside of the cockpit, as indicated by the instructions. The seat belt and cockpit control panel decals were then cut from their sheet using a sharp knife. Care has to be taken here to avoid damaging them or the other decals on the sheet. They were then soaked in warm water until they began to release from the backing paper. Humbrol decal fix was applied to the areas inside the cockpit that were to receive the decals. The decals were then carefully slid into position using either a paintbrush or the end of a knife. The decal fix will help soften the transfers so that they properly stick to the parts and can appear painted on. When the decals have stuck in place, a final coat of decal fix was brushed over the top to help soften them further. Humbrol 11 Silver Acrylic was used to highlight the details in the engine assembly. I did this by dry brushing the paint onto the area. After applying paint to the brush, it was then removed on a paper towel until only a residue remained. This ensures that the raised details receive the paint, leaving the recessed part without it. This can create a good contrast between light and dark areas. The cockpit assemblies are now cemented into one half of the fuselage assembly. Some care has to be taken here to get them in the right place. I found this to be a little confusing seeing as the top part of the nose of this model is a separate part, which can result in misalignment of the components at this stage. I remedied this by cementing the rear bulkhead with the pilot seat into one half then cemented the other fuselage half over the top. You will have to hold it together until it has set. The engine mounting ring is then added to the front of the fuselage and this is what gives it the correct distance for the two fuselage halves whilst also providing a location for the engine to be cemented. I found this to be a strange method of assembly for a 172nd scale model aircraft but it did seem to work okay. The wings can then be added to the fuselage and fit surprisingly well, with no gaps being visible. I ran the cement down the joins in order to help it bond together. The engine assembly was also then cemented into place on the front of the model. The cowling for the engine comes in two halves and can be sandwiched around the engine at this point. As I mentioned in my unboxing video, I feel as though this could allow for modification to allow the model to be displayed with them omitted, as if the aircraft is undergoing some manner of maintenance. Following the two side halves, a final end ring is cemented into place. At this point I realised that there would be a white floor visible in the cockpit, so I decided to get the Humbrol 78 matte cockpit green acrylic back out and paint the floor of the cockpit. I did this with care to avoid placing it on any of the previously painted cockpit parts. The control panel assembly was now slid into place and cemented, which was then followed by the top part of the nose. I did this at this point to help ensure that they would be correctly positioned. You might be able to notice that this method of assembly that Revell have chosen in their design has resulted in some small gaps on the nose, but I'm hoping they will disappear when I come to paint it. Next, it was time to cement the rudder into place. One half of the tail is moulded onto the fuselage, but the other half is an individual component and needs cementing on. The rudder also comes as a separate part, but slots into the tail using the locating lugs. The elevator components are next to be added and simply slide into position using the locating tabs in the correct slots in the tail. Cement was run along the joints to help them bond together. As always, just ensure the alignment is right before moving on so that they don't look wonky. The landing gear doors come as single parts, in case you decided to depict the wheels raised. 
Because of this, they will need to be cut in half following the molded groove in the plastic. I did this using a sharp knife and then sanded any rough areas. You will note that the inside of the tailwheel door has already been painted with Humbrol 78 and the wheel component with Humbrol 11. I found the tail wheel assembly to be a little fiddly. You have to make sure you get all the little locating tabs in the right places, which means quite a bit of manipulation of the parts until the glue sets them in place. The front landing gear follows a similar theme. I decided to position the legs in place, then add the cement. They come in two parts, the first having to be twisted and slotted into place, then added to the main leg when it fits into its hole. Although it looks fiddly and fragile, it actually builds up into a surprisingly sturdy set of legs. The front of the legs will require the addition of part of the landing gear cover, and you must make sure you get these the right way round. At this point, I'm adding the two pylons for the drop tanks, but I won't add the drop tanks until after painting the model to help make it a little easier. This will be the same for the wheels. I'll wait until later to add them. Here I'm adding the engine exhaust pipes. This is actually an error on my part. I should have added them at the same time I added the engine. This is because they fit under the front part of the nose and protrude over the back part. Due to this mistake in not reading the instructions correctly, I had to gently pry the engine assembly away from the fuselage just enough in order to insert these two engine exhausts into place. This wasn't too difficult and I managed to achieve it without damaging any parts. The engine was then pushed back into place and re-glued. Again, the front landing gear covers come as one part that needs cutting. It's at this stage that I add them into place. These will take a little care to make sure they don't droop to one side or the other when added to the bays. Now it's time to start painting. I began by thinning Tamiya XF2 flat white acrylic with some thinners and then proceeded to brush it over the entire model using a large flat brush. This will become the base layer for all the subsequent layers. I repeated this coat a few times primarily on the underside of the aircraft as that area is meant to be white as per the instructions. Humbrol 157 Azure Blue Matte Acrylic was then used on the upper surfaces of the model. I originally thought that this paint would be a suitable top coat, but having added the lighter side colour later, I found that it wasn't quite right. But I'll talk about that in a bit. You can see here that I'm mixing Humbrol 34 matte white acrylic with an unknown blue acrylic. The paint number on this pot has been rubbed off, but I have a feeling it could be 167 barley grey satin, but don't quote me on that. All I knew was that it looked about right for what I wanted to use it for. I made it a little lighter and thinned it down and it was used on the panels on the lower wings and also the lower sides of the fuselage. I decided to do this all freehand which took some time and patience but you could use masking tape to help get some nice neat lines. Having painted the aircraft at this point I felt the top colour wasn't dark or blue enough. So I attempted mixing Humbrol 27 and 157, but it still didn't look right. I then raided my wife's art and craft supplies and found this generic blue acrylic paint. I added some of this to the mix until I reached a colour I was happy with. I was surprised of how well it applied to the model and I think I might have to borrow some more of her paints in the future. Humbrol 135 satin varnish was thinned with some water and then applied to the entire model. This will help give a uniform finish ready for the application of decals. The satin layer will prevent the transfers from silvering when they are applied. Whilst the paint was drying, the parts which make up the drop tanks were cut from the sprue and cleaned up. Each tank comes in two halves which are cemented together quite easily. I positioned the propeller on a scrap bit of sprue which had the end pointed off. This part was then painted with Humbrol 33 matte black acrylic, which I again thinned. A number of layers would be needed. The main wheels were then cut from the sprues, cleaned up and assembled. The wheels come in two parts with the central hub on one side dropping into place and then cemented. I made some tools for holding the wheels by heating and stretching the sprue with a lighter. 
When it had cooled, I cut off the sections I needed and inserted them into the holes in the wheels so that I could hold them whilst painting. The thin strand of plastic sprue can be saved for later use as aerial wires. I again used Humbrol 33 matte black acrylic to paint these wheels. I painted the cockpit canopy using the same blend of acrylic paints I had used for the fuselage. It's best to save some in a pot if you do ever mix paints, as you might not be able to mix the exact same colour again. Various little details such as aerials might need this paint later. You'll notice that the canopy has already had one layer of paint, but at least two will be needed to get a good finish. I used a fine brush to follow the moulded lines on the canopy. If I get any paint in the wrong place, I can easily scratch it off gently using a pointed tool. I usually use a piece of sprue with a pointed end. Humbrol 11 Silver Acrylic was now used to paint the hubs at the centre of the wheels. The benefit of holding the wheel like this is that I can turn it whilst keeping the brush relatively still, giving quite good and accurate results with the paint. Now it's time to apply the decals. They were soaked in warm water until they started to release from the backing paper. Humbrol decal fix was brushed in the correct locations and then the decal slid into position carefully. More decal fix is applied over the top to help soften them into the surface details. It's worth noting that some of the decals on this kit have to be applied in certain orders. Particularly the walkway stripes on the wings needed to be added before the star decal, so careful studying of the instructions will be needed. I found the decals were quite easy to use. They are well printed and applied to the model well. They do seem a little thin, so the risk of tearing them is present whilst they are being positioned, so some care will be needed when handling them. Whilst you watch the completion of this step, I'll tell you a little about the actual Vought F4U Corsair. Introduced to service in 1942, the Corsair held the record for being the first single-engine fighter in the United States to fly faster than 400 miles per hour. Although initially only able to operate from airstrips on land, it wasn't until 1943 that it was cleared for use aboard aircraft carriers. At this time, it proved that it could outperform the Japanese Zero in everything but manoeuvrability, which a skilled pilot could use to his advantage. Armed with six 50 cal machine guns, further development would see some versions being armed with four 20mm cannons. This large amount of firepower was compounded by the use of the Corsair in the fighter bomber role where it was further armed with rockets and bombs. The aircraft proved to be somewhat successful and was exported to a number of nations including the UK, New Zealand and France to name a few. The aircraft was continually updated and modified and it continued to see service as a fighter bomber into the Korean War in 1952, where although hopelessly outclassed by the most recent jet fighters, it still managed to score aerial kills against them. With the application of decals now complete on my model, the propeller was cemented onto its locating pin on the nose. A small amount of cement was used to do this. This was then followed by the two drop tanks which were cemented to their pylons under the fuselage. I used Humbrol 24 matte trainer yellow on the tips of the propeller. Here the small details including the pitot tube on the wing and the two aerials on the fuselage are being added. I placed a small amount of cement in their locating holes then carefully positioned them. Take care here not to spoil the paint finish and also prevent the aerials from leaning to the side. Humbrol 135 satin varnish and 49 matte varnish were mixed together. I do this as the matte varnish on its own leaves a white residue. Mixing them prevents this but still results in a reasonable matte finish. I thinned this mix with a little water and applied it to the entire model. Citadel Known Oil was carefully applied in some places to help highlight the recessed detail. As most of the recessed detail is very shallow, I did not apply this wash over the entire model as it would not remain in those areas. Having not protected the acrylic layers with an enamel top coat, I also can't remove this wash with acrylic thinner, which would ultimately strip all the previous layers of paint. This step is an attempt at providing a slightly weathered look to the model. A general purpose glue was used to cement the cockpit canopy in place. 
Poly cement has a habit of fogging up clear parts and this glue does not. It does leave strings though so you must be careful when applying it. I positioned the canopy open so that the cockpit details could be viewed. Humbrol 11 Silver was dry brushed very lightly in various places to give a slightly weathered effect. This gives the impression of light chipping and damage to the paintwork. I focused around the engine, the propeller blades and access areas of the aircraft. Here I'm adding a portion of stretched sprue to the aerial locations as indicated by the instructions. I sanded a little paint from the top of the tail and antenna then using Humbrol poly cement, I place the sprue into position. I'm using this cement instead of the extra thin stuff as it won't run down the side of the antenna and spoil the paint finish. Being thicker, it will actually help hold the sprue in place whilst it sets. With the sprue in position, I removed the excess and then painted the wire with Humbrol 53 gunmetal grey to help blend it in. The final step was to dry brush a little Humbrol 33 matte black in a few locations. I did this at the gun ports, working in the direction of airflow to help represent stains. Other locations can include the engine exhausts, oil filler caps and the spent casing ejection holes. And that's as far as I went with my build of the 172nd scale F4U1A Corsair from Ravel. The model I chose to depict was that of a Corsair flown by Pappy Boyington in December 1943 whilst based in the Solomon Islands. So what do I think of this kit? Generally it goes together quite well, has reasonable detail and retailing at about £7 in the United Kingdom is good value for money. The things I'm not too happy with are the really shallow details as if like me you brush paint those details can get lost. I find the build quality to be a little odd too. For a kit that was introduced in 2014, I feel that some of the design and build choices Ravel have made are a bit strange. It's missing a pilot figure, has some strange gaps on the nose, has a surprising amount of flash for a recent kit, and has some weird assembly methods. That being said, it's a pretty good kit, which I built over a couple of days, and I think the finished model looks great. I had a lot of fun building this one, and although I did a lot of the paint scheme by eye, not using any particular paint which may result in some of the colours being inaccurate, I think that this finished model looks great and will fit in really well with the rest of my collection. In conclusion, it's a fun kit to build that does have its issues, but I'm very happy with the results I've managed to achieve with my 172nd scale Vought Corsair F4U1A from Ravel. As always, let me know what you think of my build, techniques and finished model in the comments below and feel free to leave any suggestions for future videos. Don't forget to take a look at more of my content over on my channel and once again a massive thank you to Shuttle Factory for letting me feature one of my builds on his channel. Don't forget you can see his awesome custom build of this very kit over on my channel so make sure you check it out. All that's left to say is thanks for watching and I'll see you all on the workbench again next time. Thank you for that amazing video, Matt. Make sure to check out his videos over on Model Minutes. By the way, how about checking out more content on this channel, like the ones on screen now? Thanks for watching and happy modeling.